you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to keep them open to Luke chapter 24 as we pray together this morning. Father, we are humbled by your love for us, captivated by the lengths that you were willing to go in order to to claim us as your own, to redeem us from the clutches of sin and draw us near to yourself. We are humbled by that love, and Lord, we desire to hear your voice this morning as you remind us how deeply you love us and also remind us of your love for the nations. We pray, Lord, that you would do that this morning in the name of your Son. Amen. Back in November, I took our toddler to buy a Christmas gift for my wife. This is the first time that he's been old enough to have some understanding of what's happening as we exchange gifts for Christmas. So we talked about some ideas. I wanted him to be a part of deciding what to get her. In the end, as we wind, you know, made our way around a store, he, he latched onto a pair of gloves. He was very excited. He thought mom would really love it. I tried to explain to him that they were a surprise. I told him that we would wrap them up, that she would open them on Christmas morning, and that part of the fun is that she would be surprised when she took off the wrapping paper. He seemed so excited about it, seemed like he really understood the plan. You see where this is going? Just a little while later, we saw her, and the very first thing he said is, Mom, we got you a surprise. It's gloves. (laughs) Everyone loves to share good news. Even when it's a surprise, even when their dad tries to explain to them what a surprise is, sometimes it's hard to wait because our excitement gets the better of us. Telling people about the things that bring us joy is a natural habit, and the impulse to share good news is part of what we're looking at this morning in this last chapter of Luke's gospel. At this point in the book, Jesus has just done the impossible. His 11 closest followers, the 11 remaining disciples, remember that just three days ago, his lifeless body was taken down from the cross and laid in a borrowed tomb. They grieved and they feared what this would mean for them. The one that they had believed was sent by God to bring God's kingdom into existence and then to rule over it was suddenly gone. The one that they had seen feed thousands and heal the sick and cast out demons and even raise the dead from their graves was now in a grave of his own, and they were devastated by that. With him, every shred of hope that they had, every dream that seemed like it might actually come true, every sign of God's love for them went into the ground. But now the impossible has happened. Jesus is alive again, and they can hardly believe it. Actually, that's overstating things a bit. They have serious doubts, actually, about what's happening. The last chapter of Luke's gospel is the account of three separate scenes, each of which shed a little bit of light on the bewildering experience of seeing a man who was just three days ago laid in a grave, suddenly alive and well again. These three scenes in Luke 24 have a lot in common, three things specifically. The first is disbelief and wonder about what is happening. That is the shared reaction of everyone who saw Jesus. Second, that God's Word provides a basis for understanding what is happening. And third is the joyful and unrestrained announcement of good news. That is the pattern that repeats itself three times in these three scenes in Luke 24. First, at the beginning of the chapter, where we read about the scene at the tomb itself, where several women had gone to pray and to tend to Jesus' body. But when they arrive, they see that the giant stone which had sealed off the tomb has been rolled away. They find the tomb completely empty, and then they are greeted by two angelic messengers. And suddenly they go from confused about what they're seeing to frightened by what they are seeing. But the angel tells them that Jesus is risen from the dead according to the promises of Scripture, and then they run back to town 
to tell the disciples, and Luke says, all the rest. They're just telling everyone about this experience they've just had. They have a glimmer of hope, and because of that hope, they are overjoyed and telling everyone in earshot about it. The second scene begins in verse 13 and involves two of Jesus' followers walking on a road to Emmaus, a nearby town, and on the same day that the women found the empty tomb, they set out for Emmaus. And while they're walking, Jesus himself joined them, but they did not recognize him. Maybe it's because they are so devastated by grief, or just because Jesus was the very last person they thought they would see that day, they have no idea who is walking along beside them. And as they go, they're chattering about the events of the last few days, about Jesus' death. They are mourning the loss of the one that they had believed was the Messiah sent from God. And they are talking about the rumors that have already begun to spread, that some women had seen his tomb empty, and that angels had told them he was risen. Jesus calls them in verse 25, foolish ones and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then he begins to teach them from Scripture, explaining that all of God's Word has testified to the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Then, that night, while they're eating together, we read that their eyes were opened, and suddenly they recognized, recognized who Jesus was, and then just as suddenly, Jesus vanishes from their sight. And what happens next? They run to tell the disciples about the fact that Jesus is alive again. It's the same three stages from the first scene in the chapter, disbelief and confusion, an explanation from Scripture, and the joyful announcement of very good news. Those same three moments repeat themselves again in the final scene in this chapter. When the disciples are are all together and Jesus comes into the room, John 20 tells us that the, the room where they are, they, they've locked the doors because they're afraid of the people who are out in the city. But Jesus appears among them anyway, despite the locked doors. And in that account, and in this one here in Luke, they did not welcome Jesus with a cheer. Instead, verse 37 says that they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. Even after everything else that's happened, they still cannot believe what is right in front of their eyes because it seems to them too good to possibly be true. It is easier for them to believe that this is a ghost than that Jesus is really alive again. They are full of doubt and fear, and they cannot process what they're seeing. We often hear and sometimes use the expression that seeing is believing, but the disciples They saw Jesus face to face, and they still doubted what what they were seeing with their own eyes. And Jesus doesn't tell them to trust their eyes. He tells them to trust the promises of Scripture. He explains that it is true. It is good news, and good news is meant to be shared. The 11 disciples are about to be sent out to share that good news, but nothing that we've seen so far gives us much confidence in their ministry. Throughout the book, they've struggled with confusion and doubt and fear. And in this chapter alone, we have several examples of their ongoing struggles. They refused to believe the report of the women who had seen Jesus' empty tomb and heard the word of angels announcing His resurrection. Verse 11 even tells us that the words of these women seemed to the disciples an idle tale, and they did not believe them. They dismissed the report as the result of an overactive imagination or perhaps delusion. Later, they did not recognize Jesus when He walked along the road with them. On the road to Emmaus, which was about a seven-mile trip, they had plenty of time to figure out who this stranger actually was. And they talk about the story of the empty tomb with Him, but they remain utterly clueless about who it is. When Jesus came into the room where they were gathered, the first thought that they had, the best guess that they have, is that this is a ghost. Even though Jesus had told them directly multiple times during His ministry that He would be condemned and executed and that He would rise three days later, they simply do not have a category for what they're seeing. Every time one of these scenes unfolds, it's like you can see sparks flying out of, as they're trying to figure out what is going on. 
The fact that Jesus is alive again is better than the best thing that they could have ever dared hope for. When they look at the wounds that are still present on Jesus' body, verse 41 says that they disbelieved for joy. It is just too good to possibly be true. And all three of these scenes reinforce a point that Luke evidently really wants to drive home. He goes to lengths to demonstrate that these are not men of stalwart faith and confidence in Scripture that will serve the kingdom of God with confidence and with courage. Instead, they are confused and concerned and mired in doubt, even when the resurrected Christ is in the room with them. Clearly, they need more time. They need more time with Jesus, training them and equipping them to carry on in the ministry after His departure. But after only 40 days, Jesus left. And afterward, we read in verse 52 at the very end of the book that they were joyful and they went back to the city. So that's good news, I guess. But they are still woefully underqualified for the responsibility that Jesus has left in their hands. Seeing the way that they act in this chapter, we would not bet on their success. But in verses 44 through 49, the last recorded teaching of Jesus to the disciples, he instructed them in how to establish and then how to lead the church. And it boils down to looking for God in everything that they aim to accomplish. First, in verse 44, he tells them to look back at the promise of God. Then in verses 45 through 48, the bulk of the passage, to look around for the people of God. And in the final verse, to look ahead for the power of God. Look back, look around, look ahead. This is the work that has been appointed to them and to every generation of Christians who would come after them. He knows, Jesus knows, He knows that these men better than we do, certainly, even though we have these accounts about how they acted, Jesus knows them infinitely better. He knows that they will feel helpless and worried once He isn't there to lead them, just as they were on the night that He was arrested. They are prone to scatter and to hide, to be afraid, rather than to rise to the challenge that stands ahead of them. So in these few verses, he prepares them for the responsibility that he is about to leave in their hands. And the first part of that pre preparation is a reminder to look back. These are my words, he says in verse 44, that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Before his death, Jesus had told them exactly what was going to happen. He said it plainly multiple times. Luke's gospel records two examples. In chapter 9 and chapter 18, he tells them directly that he will be arrested, abused, killed, and that afterward he would rise from the dead. He knew these things would happen, though not because or not only because he knew what was in the hearts of his opponents, even though that is true, nor simply because he knows the future, although that is true too. Jesus explains why he knew and told them what was going to happen he, t he tells them why he knew he would be arrested and killed and resurrected, and that it is because God's Word said that it would happen. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, he says, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The law anticipates the atoning death and victorious resurrection of the Son perhaps most directly in the requirement of sacrifices that covered the sin of God's people. Day after day and year after year, the blood of offerings was spilled at the temple, all so that the wrath of God against the sinfulness of His people would be averted. The law demonstrated to the world that God loves His people and desires to be near them, but that sin had driven them apart. Many of us, perhaps, have had the experience of starting off a new year fresh-eyed and optimistic about reading through the Bible in a year, only to arrive at about now and get to the book of Leviticus and find ourselves struggling. <clears throat> but the reason it's worth the effort to read through and understand and savor the book of Exodus, or Leviticus rather, and Exodus, is because of the way it preaches the gospel to us reminding us that in His affection for His people, God has made a way to deal with their sin and remain holy and just. And the writer of Hebrews draws a straight line between the law 
And Jesus, when he explains that all of those sacrifices anticipated the day when Christ's own blood would be spilled once and for all time, not only to avert the wrath of God, but to reveal the depths of his love for us. The suffering of Christ and the life-giving love of God are written on every single page of the law. Similarly, the words of the prophets anticipate the ways that God would deal with the guilt of his people, pouring out the fullness of his wrath against their wickedness, while also showing them mercy and grace. In Isaiah, God tells his people that their sin is so severe and so wicked that he is raising up foreign nations to come and conquer Israel and Judah. In his wrath, he will cause their cities to be torn down and leveled, and even the temple itself to be torn down brick by brick. But then he promises in Isaiah chapter 53 that his appointed servant will come one day and make peace for them, that he will deliver God's mercy by taking their place as the object of God's righteous wrath and judgment against sin, and that he would be crushed for their salvation. It is a promise that awaited its fulfillment. It waited for the day when the Son of God took on flesh to receive that wrath and pour out the full measure of God's love for us. Just as it was in the law, the gospel is present on every page of prophetic literature in Scripture. And the Psalms are likewise just saturated with anticipation for the work that Jesus would one day come to do. They are the words of people experiencing life in a world that is corrupted by sin and wickedness and who are dependent on God's protection and deliverance. So the gospel is infused in every single one of the 150 Psalms. There is probably no better example of this, no clearer example of this than Psalm 22, which Jesus himself quoted from the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That psalm, which describes one beloved by God being rejected and mocked and pierced in the hands and feet, but declaring that those who belong to the Lord will have reason for joy one day, is a psalm of hope, and Jesus understood that he was the fulfillment of Psalm 22. In his own suffering, he brought about the reason for joy among the people of God. What Jesus is telling the disciples here is, is that not just Psalm 22, but every psalm, every word of the law and every book of prophecy have anticipated what they have seen fulfilled. Everything that has happened has happened because God said it would happen. And hindsight for these 11 disciples is 2020. Even when Jesus told them what would happen, when he told them what was coming, they did not understand it, But now they have seen Jesus crucified and risen, and they will read the Scriptures with fresh eyes that see and minds that understand what God has been saying all along. Looking backward at the promises of God and seeing how He has providentially organized all of history to bring about His good and gracious ends, they'll have a different view of the future and the calling that they've been given. As Jesus prepares to send these men out into the world as the heralds of the gospel message to the leaders uh, and the leaders of the church, this is the foundation he wants them standing on. What God says he will do, he will do. What God promises, he will sovereignly and providentially bring about, just as surely as he promised on every page of the law and the prophets, and the Psalms, that He would deliver His people through the loving and substitutionary sacrifice of His Son on their behalf. He said He would do this, and He did. And knowing that, the disciples can go with confidence rather than fear, because success in this mission that they're given hangs on the strength and the sovereignty of God rather than their own. This is a necessary thing for them to keep in mind. It's a necessary thing for us to keep in mind as well, considering what they're being called to do. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, we read in verse 45, and said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. This is what the promise was, that Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Suddenly, they understand 
the light bulb has clicked on and they see what Jesus has known all along, that God's plan for the redemption of his people has always been the death and the resurrection of his son. Now they will flip through the pages of scripture and see Jesus on every page. He is the son of Eve, who God promised would crush the head of the serpent, but who would be wounded in doing so. He is the ram who is caught in the thicket, who takes Isaac's place on the altar and dies so that Isaac does not have to. He is the Passover lamb whose blood is shed so that the judgment of God would pass over those who are marked by it. He is the one forsaken by God as the author of Psalm 22 thought he was so that in his forsakenness his people might be adopted as God's own sons and daughters. He is the servant of God from Isaiah 53, by whose stripes and wounds we are healed, who was crushed for our iniquities, and who makes intercession for sinners. These are the things that Scripture promised that God would bring about, but, and this is critical, they are not all that God has promised to bring about. It is written, Jesus says, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. This is the promise of Scripture. But Jesus does not stop there. And that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. It's easy to miss the significance of what Jesus is saying here. The good news of salvation, the promise that all of history has been waiting to see fulfilled, that all of Scripture has been anticipating, is to be proclaimed around the world. It's to be carried to the nations. The Greek word for nations here is a reference to, uh, perhaps is more accurately translated, people groups, not the political designations that we see drawn on maps. And not just the nations, but all the nations, every people group, every culture, every social class, every city, every tribe, every family, in every corner of the globe. The gospel is good news for everyone. But that much is obvious from what Jesus says here. The subtle amazing thing is that Jesus says this work is promised in Scripture right alongside the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Jesus says in this passage three things were written in Scripture, promised in the pages of Scripture, that the story of redemption has three parts, that the Messiah would suffer, that he would rise from the dead, and that the gospel would be carried to the ends of the earth. For these uncertain, bumbling, fear-prone disciples, this is both intimidating and encouraging. Intimidating because they are just 11 men without any formal training or qualification. Of the careers that we know about that they had, most of them were fishermen before following Christ. Since that time, they've spent three years with Him only to see Him rejected by the very people He came to save abused and condemned by the religious institution that studied the very scriptures that promised his coming. And now, they are supposed to go and proclaim God's message in the very city where Jesus was crucified and beyond its borders to every people group, people group on earth. It is an incomprehensibly big job, and they are woefully ill-equipped to carry it out. But just as surely as God has ordained that all of history would bring about the events that precipitated Jesus' death and resurrection according to the Word of God, so He will providentially provide for the announcement of that good news among the nations. It is a promise, and what God says He will do, He will do. It's a promise that depends on God's power, not theirs. And that, Jesus is saying, is written in the pages of the Old Testament too. In the promise to Abraham, that his descendants would be a blessing to the nations, in God's assurance to Moses that the nations would know the name of the Lord after the exodus, in the commands of the law for the people of God to welcome the foreigner and the outsider, and in the promise that the people of God would be a light to the Gentiles, a beacon of hope that God would use to draw them close. God's heart for the nations is evident on every single page of Scripture long before Jesus commissioned the disciples to go and make disciples. And now, in these words from Jesus, as the gospel goes out beyond the walls of Jerusalem in the hands of these people, God is bringing about what the law, the prophets, 
and the Psalms have anticipated. So their calling is to look out to the nations where God is already at work, where His heart already resides, drawing people to Himself and to go and proclaim the gospel. And in knowing that, the disciples can walk in confidence even if they remain ill-equipped for the work. In superhero movies, there's typically a moment where the mild-mannered scientist gets bitten by a radioactive something and wakes up the next day with super strength and the ability to save the world from certain doom. But the disciples are the same guys that they've been the whole time. When they look in the mirror, they see the same thing they saw yesterday. And on top of that, they're given no specific instructions from Jesus about how to do the work that they've been left to carry out. I went to grad school for three years and spent more than a decade before and after that working in a local church under godly pastors learning about the the beginning of being a leader in the church. These guys had 40 days with Jesus after the resurrection, and it seems like a lot of that time they were just trying to wrap their brains around the fact that he wasn't a ghost. Now, They are suddenly in charge of leading a global movement, and they're wondering what everyone else is wondering, and that is how they could possibly do what Jesus is telling them to do and what Scripture has promised that they will do. They're like the JV basketball team from a local high school being told to go and play the Celtics. It does not matter how good of a pep talk the coach gives them in the locker room before that game. They are going to get flattened. It will be a miracle if they put one point on the board. And that's why in the final verse of this passage, the last thing Jesus is recorded saying in this gospel, the 11 disciples are told to wait. It's the only imperative in this whole scene, the only time Jesus gives them a direct command, is when he says in verse 49, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit is coming. That is what will make the difference. The promise of God will be carried, according to the promise of Scripture, it will be carried by the people of God, and the mission of God will succeed in the power of God. Even though Jesus won't be with them physically, His Spirit will be nearer to them than Jesus ever had been. Jesus says they'll be clothed in power, which is an evocative phrase. They'll be wrapped up in and carried along by the very presence of God. By the indwelling Spirit, they'll be capable of what they weren't before. We see that throughout the book of Acts, where after the coming of the Holy Spirit, these 11 fearful, confused, and doubting disciples are able to lead with confidence and wisdom and a command of Scripture that helps people see what Jesus has just helped them see here in Luke 24, that in love, God has promised to deliver His people from sin and that His people are made up of those from all around the world. So for now, as they return to the city after the last line of the book of Luke, they have joy in their hearts and they must look ahead. And when the Spirit comes, these ill-equipped men will be able to do what would have otherwise been impossible for them. They will reach the nations, establish the, the church, and the gates of hell itself will not overcome it. In fact, that's what we see in the book of Revelation where we read, that people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, will stand before God in praise. The work begun in the first century with the promise of Scripture and empowered by God's own affection for the nations will be finished one day. And that is why we know that the responsibility that was given to these 11 disciples has become our responsibility. Because the picture of the church gathered in the presence of God in the book of Revelation is one made up of people of every single tribe and tongue and language. But the furthest that these 11 guys carried the gospel was the other side of the Mediterranean Sea to Spain and North Africa. The picture that we see in Revelation includes people from South America and Scandinavia and Southeast Asia and every other corner of the globe. So the calling to go and preach the gospel was not meant for these 11 disciples alone, but for the church in every generation. Jesus says in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. And just as he says it to the disciples in the first century, so he says it to us today. In his wisdom and grace, this is how God has chosen to build his kingdom. The church is the tool 
that God uses to reach the lost. That means you and me. Hearing that, we might feel what the disciples felt when Jesus told them that it was their calling to deliver the gospel to the ends of the earth. We might feel small and insignificant and overwhelmed by the responsibility. We might feel like there are others who are better qualified and better suited, and that is almost certainly true. But God, in His grace, shows us, not only by redeeming us from the clutches of sin, but also by sending us out with the liberating message of the gospel to those who are held, still held tightly in His grip, that His grace is deeper than your, your salvation or mine. It goes far beyond that to people who do not yet know Him and have never heard His name. At Westgate, this is one of our most closely held core commitments. Someone who's been at Westgate for just a few weeks has already seen that we are devoted to seeing the gospel preached among the nations. Our missions board is always busy keeping us connected to and in partnership with brothers and sisters serving in ministry around the globe. We take time every year at the missions conference to invest in those relationships and to remind ourselves of the necessity of their work and our commitment to it. We pray for mission work every week. We get this yellow piece of paper in our worship folder every month updating us on the specific prayer requests of our missions partners around the globe. This is a priority for us. As a church, we care about missions, and we've codified it in one of our core commitments, which says that Christ's commission to His church applies not only to reaching people with the gospel locally, but making disciples of all people groups around the globe. To that end, we view global missions as an essential ministry of our church and our individual members. We are committed to mobilizing our own resources for the objective of reaching men and women from every nation and people group that Christ might be treasured above all things. We believe, we are convinced that missions is not an add-on to the gospel, It's not an optional extra that only some super committed, super qualified, super courageous Christians decide to take on. Global missions is part of the gospel. In fact, it is the last chapter of God's plan of redemption, begun in the promise that Eve's descendant would crush the head of the serpent who had deceived her in the garden. That promise was handed down generation to generation where God added to the scope of what He would do in His saving work. The law and the prophets and the Psalms promise us that God will do this work and that it will be for all the nations. That promise is repeated again and again until its fulfillment came to earth in the birth of Jesus Christ. And in His life and death and resurrection, He made a way for sinners to be set free and made sons and daughters of God, redeemed by grace and now given new life. And in the final chapter of that redemption story, It is the same as every one of those three scenes we saw in Luke 24, the unrestrained and joyful announcement that ours is a God who saves. So gospel people are, by nature, mission people. And the responsibility to ensure the hope of the gospel, to ensure that the hope of the gospel is carried to the ends of the earth, is our responsibility. So let us today reaffirm this core commitment, assured by the promises of Scripture, sharing in God's affection for the lost, and going with confidence in knowing that God's power is sufficient, not only to claim victory over death itself, but to reach the nations with new life. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning that you would remind us of your love for the nations that your love for the nations is love for us as well, because we are the recipients of the message that is sent into the world in the hands of the disciples, the objects of your love beyond the walls of Jerusalem. Now, as we consider how you are still at work around the world, we pray that you would write that affection on our hearts as well. Give us confidence in your promise knowing that it is the same promise that has brought us into your family. Lord, we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. As we respond together this morning.